The neighbor over here is learning how to play banjo. And he had his first lesson about a week and a half ago. And last night, some uh, his friends came over. And when he finally heard him knocking at the door, you know, or when they knocked at the door, he opened the door and uh, they said, we've been sitting here, or sitting, we've been standing here for five minutes listening to you do the same thing over and over again. And Aaron went kind of, oh? He says, yeah, you're really bad. And he responded by saying, well, I'm just learning. And you have to play it over and over again because I'm practicing. Now, this is a young man that uh, also plays trumpet, and he's very, very good on trumpet, and he's a very talented musician. But he decided he was going to learn to play banjo. <clears throat> And he's practicing it over and over again. Matter of fact, he practices a little bit every day. Uh, I gave him his first banjo lesson, and, and he informed me that once he left and went off to practice, that he practiced till about 12 o'clock at night, which I thought was pretty obsessive. Because that means he practiced for another two hours after he left, because he showed up at my door kind of late in the day. I'm ready for that banjo lesson that you've been promising me. Well, the practice of meditation is exactly like that. Just like the practice of life is exactly like that. There isn't really a whole lot of difference between meditation and life. And I used to think years ago when I was involved in a lot of intensive meditation retreats and I was looking for a way to talk to people about what they were actually doing because um, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. And um, I know for the youth of today, this could get pretty boring, you know, because they want some excitement. Uh, there's very little excitement in meditation. And uh, immediate gratification, doggone it, you just got to look everywhere and you can't find any that they're immediate gratification. Matter of fact, worst case scenario, you might do a nice long period of meditation and feel like you're in worse shape than when you started because you, nothing else is going good that day and you tried to do some meditation and that really didn't go good that day. Meditation itself is very simple. Even the most complex of meditations is very simple. Once you realize that you only have a set number of things to do. Now it may not be simple in the sense of you can do it. I don't mean that. But the simple meditation that we start every Sunday with uh, we don't go into any of the other structured meditations. There's many, many structured meditations within Buddhism. You're simply following your breath. If you have a meditation practice that you do, if you and I have worked on a meditation practice or some other teacher has assigned something to you, well, then obviously that's what you'd be doing. But none of it is involved. None of it is that complicated. Yet some people will practice meditation for 10 or 11 years and still not feel that they are doing what they need to do. And they may not be doing what they need to be doing. When I began the practice of Zen, uh, I immediately was taught to do Shikantaza. <clears throat> it was easily four years before I actually did Shikantaza. I can't really tell you what I was doing before that. I thought I was following the directions really well and I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, but one time I actually did it right and I realized, my gosh, four wasted years of not doing it right. And sometimes we look at things as, where is that immediate reward? It is a very common thing for people to come around a Zen center and ask how long it's going to take to learn meditation. A less common question is, how long will it be before I am enlightened? So we can call that, how long does it take to learn to practice and how long does it take to be a really important person that knows all the answers to every question that was ever asked? And there was a teacher a long time ago, when asked this question, 
responded in by way of encouragement and told the person, well, a couple of years. Within a couple of years, you're pretty well ought to have this mastered. So the guy responded by saying, well, how about if I work twice as hard and I make twice as much effort? And the teacher said, about four years. The guy said, well, what if I just dedicate my entire life to this? I don't do anything but the practice of Zen. Everything else goes by the wayside. I won't have a life. I'll just do Zen. He said, about ten years. Guy went away shaking his head, didn't understand. There is no difference between the practice of Zen and the practice of life. How long is it going to take you to get good at it? Tell me that you live your life day to day and you're always happy with everything you do. You're always happy with every decision you make. You're always happy with the fact that someone that you don't particularly care for said something to you that made you very, very unhappy and you said something that you're really sorry you said. And if you've never been in a situation where you walked into a room and somebody got you, and by the way, in Zen parlance, you lost. If we wanted to call it Dharma combat, you just lost the fight because they got you. And the gotcha wasn't that they said something that bothered you. That's a little gotcha. The gotcha was that you reacted. And if you're honest with yourself, you know you went away and you said, and you may be very conflicted. You may say, well, I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have reacted. I shouldn't have let her get to me one more time. I shouldn't have let him pull my chain. Doggone it, they know where that button is I have, and they pushed it, and they push it every time they get a chance to push it, and they got a reaction out of me. And while all of this is going on, there's a very strong sense that that person and everybody has somebody that in their, like that in their life. That person is the problem. If only that person would go away, would leave you alone, move to another town, disappear, then everything would be okay. But here's the problem. That person is not really the one that makes you react. It isn't the one that provided that button in the middle of your chest that they push and you react to it every time. That person who's very irritating is not the person that's getting irritated. There are people that go around and enjoy very much manipulating other people. They derive power from it. You know, some people manipulate people to get what they want. Kids learn to do this at a very young age. If they didn't, and I think every kid learns to do it. They go to mom, she says no, they go to dad. The manipulation begins. Wise parents say, have you seen your mother? The kid closes his eyes and goes, no, I didn't see mom. Okay, they know how to get around it. We learned how to manipulate. Matter of fact, if there's anything we need to unlearn is how to manipulate people. How to be honest. You want something, just say you want something. That's really hard to do because you know if you're, the person you're asking for something is inclined to say no, you want to set the stage. Get everything perfectly set up. I mean, we just got done with a national manipulation. I can't imagine a politician that could be a politician without manipulating people. Whatever your opinion of the election of the president was, whether you're happy about who got elected, you're unhappy about who got elected, you have been manipulated. Because that's what good politicians do. They tell you what you want to hear. They de-emphasize the things you don't like. They point out how good they are about the things you do like. So if you think you made a nice level-headed judgment, whatever judgment you made, Probably not, because it's very hard for us, particularly if we like someone. If you like President Bush, but you're not altogether happy with what he did, well, you try not to think about the things you don't like, right? You do that with a good friend. You point out to yourself all the good attributes and kind of push the bad attributes to the side. 
Well, politicians know how to work that. But we do it to ourselves. We do it to people. And it, there's a problem with it. We're not honest. And in order to have a practice, to have the practices in, you have to be honest. And that doesn't mean you tell somebody when they ask you, what do you think of my hair? It looks like crap. That's not the kind of honesty we're talking about. The honesty we're talking about is you go to practice. Did you practice or did you kill time? Did you practice or did, did you just play around and daydream? Meditation hall is the greatest place in the world to daydream. No distractions. It's quiet. We try to keep it comfortable for you. You can sit in there and you can fantasize for hours. But the reason why we do long retreats is you have to be a very special person to daydream for too many hours. Eventually, you just get tired of the game. And then you're stuck. You're trapped. You can't get away. You're sitting on this little round cushion you know, I don't care how good the daydream is, how many times can you replay it? I don't care how good the movie is, how many times can you watch it in a row without a break, without saying, okay, I'm done with that. So the practice of meditation is a practice of learning not to do that stuff, of just letting it go. When you walk into the meditation hall, there all these little things we do, we help set the stage for going in there. Or, of course, our meditation hall is the building at the foot of this little hill. But when you walk in there and take off your shoes and come to the door and you bow, you're setting your mind. You should be taking off your shoes and leaving all your troubles at the doorstep. And we're not romantics. We don't think that the troubles aren't going to be there unless a dog comes along and takes your shoes. That happened one time. It made everybody really nervous. <laughs> But otherwise, your troubles are going to be there when you get back to the door. Everything that's going wrong is still going to be there. The lesson here is, is that you don't have to worry about it 24 hours a day because worrying about things hasn't fixed anything anyway. So when you come in and you bow, you should just feel like everything's being shed. And when we sit down on the cushion and everybody settles in and they stretch a little bit and they kind of wiggle around and find their center of balance, and then we do the Om Mani Padme Um three times together, conscious of how we sound, just kind of trying to find a little spot for our voice to fit in so we, if we don't harmonize, we blend, and, and get together on this thing. And now the meditation has started. That little bit of ritual is a preamble to you letting go just letting go. But we're human, so we're sitting there and we've got these problems and maybe that we showed up on this particular day because we're just not able to deal with the problems. We can't let go of them. So we come to sit with some other people to help encourage us because we try to sit at home and we have 15 minutes of chaos or half an hour of chaos then the only thing that's being accomplished at home is we've convinced ourselves we're totally incapable of doing anything about our problems because we look at meditation as being part of the solution. So we come to sit with other people and then we play games with ourselves because this manipulation thing I started talking about, well, yeah, we learn to do it with our parents and stuff, but we manipulate ourselves. We go to do something that we know that's not right, and we talk ourselves into it. There's a reason why they say a sociopath has no conscience. Because there's no voice that talks to them about not doing something. But we all have a voice, and we gave it a name. And it's a conscience. And it's ourselves manipulating ourselves. Whether the manipulation's for good or bad, it's still manipulation. And we have this conversation about how we really shouldn't take that thing, or we really shouldn't do that thing, or whatever it is, or we really shouldn't eat that thing, because we're on a diet, and son of a gun, a piece of pecan pie, it's only a few calories, like 3,000 or something, you know, the daily allotted calorie intake for an adult male, one piece of pecan, I had a piece of pecan pie Friday night, one piece of pecan pie, see, I don't, 
have a problem with that kind of conversation. I just eat the pie. I have the conversation after eating the pie, not before it. Steve has some self-control. He has the conversation before. Nope, I better not eat that. Kind of watching my weight. When we sit in that meditation hall, when we're quiet, when there's no sound because there's no talking, we're supposed to learn how to be quiet. That includes wiggling around and making noise. That includes heavy religious breathing. I'm trying to be positive here. Once in a great while, we, we're, we're lucky and we have a person sitting in there that sounds like they just got done with a 24-mile run and all this breathing stuff's going on. <coughs> And they might even, there's books, they might even have read about this in a book, you know, special Zen breathing. And um, since we're a nonviolent group, we don't get to throw anything at them, but they're sitting there doing all this breathing, and we try to encourage them to not breathe so loud by being quiet. And the quieter it gets, the louder they get. And sometimes they just don't figure it out. Because they're so caught up in this breathing, they think, I'm really doing this, and all these other guys are amateurs. They haven't figured out how to do the special fire-kindling, mind-awakening breathing. The Buddha said we were a bundle of habits. We are a bundle of conditioning. Psychologists have come along in the last 30, 40 years for a while, Skinnerism was very, very popular, talking about nobody has any free will. Everything's conditioning. Well, Buddhists know what that's about. Cause and effect. Effect and cause. Cause and effect. Chain reactions. The problem here is, and I, and I know if B.F. Skinner was sitting in that chair, he'd just shoot me down in a heartbeat. But to my simple mind, a kid that picks up a banjo for the first time and practices for three hours is trying to form good habits. And having picked up a banjo and practiced for three hours and the fingers hurt and you feel dumb and things aren't going right and it doesn't even sound good and you can question yourself, why am I doing this? Not only does it sound bad, but it's not comfortable to do. It's not comfortable to hold. My hands don't feel good. They start to hurt. I suppose we can make a rationale there's a reason why somebody does that. But I'd like to leave it alone and say that we do have some free choice here. We can decide to do some things. Like we can decide to be nice. Some children are described by their parents as the nicest child I ever knew. And some children are described as the child from hell. Okay, the child from hell can decide to be nice. Just like sometimes very nice children have to take assertiveness courses because they let people walk all over them. And they don't have to become the child from hell. They just have to learn how to say, no, I don't think I want to do that today. No, I don't think I'm going to let you borrow my car. I know you would like to borrow that money so that you could go to Las Vegas and make a lot of money, but... I think I'll keep it in the bank. These are all habits, but there's always choices. It's like the kid that says, well, I didn't have any choice. He said something bad about my mom. I had to hit him in the nose. <coughs> no, you didn't. You really didn't have the choice at that moment of whether you're going to be happy or not, but you did have the choice of whether you hit him in the nose. High school students do that all the time. Everything's about emotion. Everything's about externals, about the unimportant stuff that changes. Some of them look back 20 years later and can't figure out why they even got upset. The practice of meditation is the practice of letting go of those kind of things. Bad thoughts come up in your head, just let go of them. They may or may not go away. Sometimes people will ask the question, well, how long do I have to do this before I stop getting distracted? How in the world would I ever know the answer to that? I've seen people that came to meditate and they were never distracted. 
they just sat down and they were just as solid as the day is long. Of course, they were pretty dysfunctional. They couldn't do anything else in their life, you know, because their energy level was so low that they didn't weren't interested in anything else, and they just sort of stumbled around through life. But boy, you set them under a tree, they could sit there for hours, and you'd say, well, are you thinking about anything? No, I'm not thinking about anything. Well, what do you think about when you're not meditating? Nothing. Well, what are your interests? Nothing. <coughs> well, what do you like? Nothing. Well, what do you dislike? Nothing. That's a vegetable, by the way. We're describing a very large potato with legs on it. So it's just practicing and practicing and practicing the same thing over again. And it's not complicated, but it's very hard. Somebody says something mean to you. You practice letting go of it. You even had a conversation with yourself yesterday that you're sick and tired of people getting you riled up and making you angry. And you're blaming it on the other people. Wisdom starts to arrive when you realize that, yeah, maybe that person is a jerk. And maybe they're doing everything they can to upset you. But you're letting them. You really are letting them when you react. And once you realize what's going on, then you just have to exhale and let go. Just exhale and let go. And that's all we do in the cushion. Thoughts come up. Good thoughts, bad thoughts. There's really no difference between them. You can have a really good thought and go, well, I want to think about this. Nobody will know. I'll just go ahead and think about this one here. How could anybody know? I've even heard teachers say, well, you know, if it can't, and I don't agree with this. Well, if you can't get rid of it, then maybe you should just sit there and think about it. All righty then. We know what experience they had. Because if you do think about it over and over and over for hours, it'll eventually wear out and go away. But some people would say, well, you stop practicing your banjo. Yeah, you did turn the record player on and listen to some music, but you weren't practicing the banjo because the practice is letting go. The practice is always letting go. You go to paint a wall, you get the wall painted, you stand back and you see all the mistakes. Now, the Zen approach to this, after going and having a cup of tea and kicking the, the another wall in response, now really just, the Zen response would be go fix the mistakes you made or go fix the mistakes you made and repaint the wall. But some people stand back, took them an hour to paint the wall, they spend three hours being miserable because it looks bad. Some people try to fix something and it doesn't get fixed and they're defeated. On the meditation cushion, you probably in a half an hour period, I would say, would be able to be distracted and come back to your meditation a hundred times. That's entirely possible. I tried to figure out when I first was meditating why people even meditated. Because myself, personally, I had a little difficulty concentrating. I know that some people do really, Kaya does really good. She just sits down, no distractions, just solid like a big boulder. Not me. I'd sit down. I was distracted by everything. I was distracted by the fact that my legs hurt. I was distracted by the ice cream truck. I was distracted by the pattern on the cushion on the wall that I was facing. I was distracted by the guy who sat next to me who happened to be a monk and who was snoring because he, he would go to sleep five minutes to end any meditation on any day. Okay? And he was very proud of himself because he would wake up just before the bell would ring. He had an internal alarm clock. You could, you could feel him just waking up, and getting all alert, so that when the bell rang, he'd bow with everybody. But you, you knew he was sleeping because it was going on. I was distracted by how long is this going to go on? I was distracted by am I doing this right because it feels like it's Time's really going fast. I was distracted by everything. And we haven't even got to problems. I mean, I'm just talking about the physical layout of where I was. So I know about distraction. And I remember finally deciding that the only logical reason anybody could decide to meditate, I always felt that I was weird, so I probably did it because I was a secret masochist. You know, and I enjoyed pain. I don't think I do, but I thought, well, maybe secretly in the back of my mind, I, I'm punishing myself for something. 
And then one day, I had this experience. And the experience couldn't have been very long because when you have the experience right, you don't know how long it is anyway. But I'm guessing it couldn't have been more than three or four minutes. Maybe five on the outside. Where after wiggling and struggling and messing around and being distracted by my leg that always went to sleep and then being distracted by the pain of the leg that went to sleep and then being distracted by this and that, I actually meditated. And when the bell rang, it was not welcome, but it was also not resented. It was just time to bow. And I walked outside, and we had a rose garden at that temple, and I about got knocked down by the brilliance of the colors because I had at least three or four minutes of real meditation took place. And I realized then why these people came back. Because a lot of people don't come back. They come one time or two time. They don't get any big rush. They don't walk out feeling empowered. I think that's why the Tibetans empower people, you know. Here, let me empower you. Now you can feel empowered. But I think people get a glimpse, whether it's 30 seconds or 45 seconds or a minute. And that's all it is. And I don't think there's anything rational about it. I don't think they think to themselves, gosh, if I could do this for an hour, maybe later on they do. But I think they come back the next week because they liked it. It felt good. My teacher used to say that the mind never rests except in meditation. We're the only animal that talks to itself constantly. All the time we're talking to ourselves. We talk to ourselves so much that when we go to bed, after we've gone to sleep, we start talking to ourselves again, and we call it dreams. And people theorize, well, we have dreams because we weren't able to figure out problems during the day. And, the, and now, in this different situation, we can solve these problems in our dreams. But when we do meditation, it's the one time we don't talk to ourselves. And this is why I disagree with this teacher who said, well, you know, if you just can't stop thinking about it, maybe you should think about it on a cushion. Ah, you had 23 hours in the rest of the day to think about it. If you're going to fix it by thinking about it, fix it then. When you get on the cushion, let go of it. Because I had another teacher that said, big problems are solved on a cushion by not thinking about them. People used to come to him with their personal problems, and they go, I just can't figure out what to do. Please tell me what to do. And he'd go, sit. Go sit. If they came to see him during the day when there was no service going on, and they said, I've got to talk to you about this personal problem. I don't know what decision to make. He said, fine, let's go in here and we'll sit. He'd sit with them for an hour. They'd get up. He'd just look at them. I don't think he ever gave them any personal advice in his entire life. He'd say to them, okay? And they were afraid, so they'd go, okay, whether it was or not. Because they thought he had a lot of wisdom, that he knew all the answers. He did. He had one answer to every problem in the world. Sit. Let go. And then the answer will appear on its own. 